welcome back to my friends from Brumley Baptist Church. Hope that you're doing well, that you've had a good Sunday in the Lord's house, and you're ready to kind of finish that out with a little more study tonight on sanctification. And we have been really slowly going through the last few verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and the reason we've gone so slow is because there's some really good stuff here about how do we grow in our faith, the hope of every pastor as Paul's hope for the church at Corinth, my hope for the church at Brumley, and every pastor's hope is that the people there will grow to be more like Jesus. That's the goal. And if anything else is the goal, then we've missed the point of Scripture. And I think we've missed the command of Scripture even more so. So we've slowed down because the Bible has given us the opportunity to do so with the way that it's presented these verses. And the last one has been security. How do we grow in Christ if we don't know we're secure in Christ? You know, my marriage has grown, and part of the reason it's grown is because I know that Megan and I are secure together, that God has brought us together, and that no man can separate us. Well, since that's the truth, that deepens that relationship. Well, in your salvation relationship, if, if you're concerned about losing your salvation all the time, you can't grow deeper in that love because you're just trying to keep the, keep the connection. And so we've talked a little bit about what does sanctification look like in relation to um, assurance. And that first video was last week, and you can find that on this same channel. But I want to go kind of the next step this week as we look at that together. And the best way I did that is just to show you my notes and show you exactly what I was talking from. And so 1 John 5, 13 says, we have written these things that you can know you have eternal life. And we said last week, this is, do we follow his commandments? Secondly, do we care about the other brothers and sisters? Do we have compassion? So we had the commandment section and the compassion section. Do we follow what Jesus said, and do we love the other brothers and sisters in Christ? And again, you can go back to last week and catch up on those as well. Um, this week, I want to transition from the compassion section and move a little bit into the Christ likeness section, okay? So let's, let's transition by looking at 1 John 4.20. Uh, if anyone says, I love God and yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For the person who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this is the command from him. The one who loves God must also love his brother. I will remind you just again, should we love the lost world? Absolutely. We have plenty of verses for that. But these specific verses in 1 John, based on the context, are talking about the church. And I hear people all the time grab one of these verses and use it to apply to evangelism or loving someone who's in sin or those sort of things. Yes, we should love them, and there's plenty of verses for that. These are not those verses. These verses speak to the fact that, hey, we need to love the church, love the brothers and sisters, which leads me to section three, the Christ likeness section. These verses reveal the truth that genuine believers live a different life than the world around them. Everyone who commits sin practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed so that he might take away sins, and there is no sin in him. Everyone who remains in him does not sin. Everyone who sins has not seen him or known him. And let me be clear, this doesn't mean that Christians are perfect, far from it. What this applies to is people who live in a lifestyle of sin. If you love Jesus, you can't just go out and sin and sin and sin and it not bother you or not affect you. That's what these verses do mean. You can't live in continual sin and be a Christian. That's simply what the Bible says. It's not my opinion. It's not what I think. It's what the verses say. Everyone who has been born of God does not sin because his seed remains in him. He is not able to sin because he's been born of God. Now, again, these are all in present active verb tenses, meaning, again, living in, continues in. So it, there is far from an idea here that a Christian never commits a sin. The idea taught here is, though, that Christians don't go out and willfully sin over and over and over and over again without any sort of concern or care. 
So if a lifestyle is literally built on a foundation of sinfulness, according to first John, you can't be a Christian. Again, these are tests to know that we are in the faith. So if, if whatever that lifestyle is, you know, it doesn't have to be a certain thing, whatever that lifestyle is, if it's not allowing you to live in holiness, then it's not a Christian lifestyle. Number four, the companion section. First John 3, 24, not only will the genuine believer have the external marks of salvation, uh, love for the brethren, that sort of things, we'll also want to have inner evidence. First John 3, 24, the one who keeps his commands remains in him and he in him. And the way we know he remains in us is the spirit he has given us. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't have salvation. It is that cut and dried and that plain and simple. Just as we go over here and think about, okay, the, the Christ likeness, are we growing in holiness? Well, how are we doing that? Through the Holy Spirit. And those things go together. You can't be growing in the Holy Spirit if you don't have the Holy Spirit. You can't be growing to be more like Jesus unless the Holy Spirit is residing within you. And if the Holy Spirit is residing within you, you can't help but be growing to be more like Jesus. These are reciprocal things. They go together. They are symbiotic. They need each other. They go together. Love and marriage, you know. What does a plant need, sunlight or water? Yes. <laughs> if it just has water, no good. If it just has sunlight, no good. But those things together cause that to happen. Well, you can't just be holy and not have the Holy Spirit, and you can't just have the Holy Spirit and not be holy. Those things have to go together. And again, that's the, the beauty of the book of 1 John. It is written so that we can know we have salvation. That's where this assurance comes in in our sanctification. If you know you are saved, you can now simply focus on growing in holiness. So that's the companion section. The companion section. And it's a very important part of this idea. Moves lastly to the commitment section. First John 5, 1. The true believer is one who is trusting Jesus alone for salvation. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ and has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father also loves the one born of him. You got to be committed to Christ. Now, not were you committed to Christ back one day long ago or whatever. I'm asking you today, if you want to know today, this day, that you are secure in your faith, I'm going to ask you then this day, are you committed to Christ? Are you committed to Christ? 1 John 5, 13 tells us that faith in Christ is the ground of our hope. I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. You have to be committed to Jesus. If you're not committed to Jesus, salvation is, is not even on the table, not even part of the discussion, not even in the picture. You must be committed to Jesus Christ, like wholly committed to Jesus Christ, all in committed to Jesus Christ. There are no kind of disciples or sort of followers. Can you imagine, going back to our earlier analogy, if I told you that Megan was kind of my wife, she's sort of my bride, I'm kind of her husband? No, she is or she isn't. Well, this question is for you to answer. Are you committed to Jesus? If you are, then you can know with assurance of your salvation. If you're not, then you can't. It really is that simple. It's not a feeling, it's not an emotion. It's not your name on a church role or church membership or a story you can tell me about something that happened so long ago. I'm asking you right now, are you committed to Jesus? I'm going to ask you right now, do you have the Holy Spirit living within you? I'm going to ask you right now, do you have a desire to be more like Christ, to not live in sin every day? I'm going to ask you, do you love the brothers and sisters as part of the church, do you have compassion and care and concern for them? I'm going to ask you, are you trying to follow the commands of Jesus? 
I'm going to ask you, if you're struggling with your salvation, would you go read 1 John? Would you go read just this very short book in the New Testament, the book, the epistle of 1 John, and just read through those things? Because you'll notice over and over again, this is how we know we are from God. Anyone who knows God, this is what the love of God is to keep his commandments. We know we have passed from death to life. I mean, over and over again, it's going to tell you in this short little book, you can know these things. I'll also post uh, these notes because you can see I've got several more pages of notes after this where you can look at an outline of First John and get some more detail about it. But br brothers and sisters, I want you to know that you know you're saved. And I believe the Bible teaches very plainly here in 1 John 5, 13, that you can know you have passed from death to life and that you are assured in your faith. And if you are assured in your faith, then you can grow in sanctification to be more and more like Jesus Christ. And I pray that that's what you want to do. And that's what you're striving to do every single day. Romney, have a good and godly day. And until I see you again, go serve your king.